Hello to my first Lutheran family. This is Pastor Phil Vickers with this uh, final installment of November's Faith Time video ministry series. I hope you'll join us after second service on Sunday for an in-person discussion of these topics. And also, if you care to, afterwards, uh, they'll be doing the Hanging of the Greens up in the sanctuary. That's our annual uh, decoration for Advent and Christmas. Uh, so if you want, you can join us and then head on up to help with that. We didn't get to do the Hanging of the Greens last year, and so it'll be extra special this year. Um, so we've talked this month about sin, justification, atonement, sanctification. Today we're going to talk about the theological concept of inspiration, particularly as it applies to the Holy Scriptures. So every Christian tradition that I know of believes in some version of the idea of inspiration, which just as at its base means that God had a hand in producing the Bible. There is a huge amount of variety among individual Christians, congregations, denominations, about what exactly that means. And we'll talk about that in this video. But every tradition that I know of believes that God had a hand in some way in producing the Bible. One of the interesting things to think of is that it's sort of, you have to come to a double idea of inspiration because you, um, you believe that, you know, uh, God had a hand in inspiring the authors, but also you have to believe that God um, guided the church to include that book in the Bible. And of course, we know the Bible just didn't fall out of the sky. The church at various councils got together and said, this reflects God's truth, this, this does, this does, and so it, they assemble it into the Bible. You know, and um, uh, that's troublesome for some people because it seems too, uh, you know, too very human, but that's where, the, that's where we, that's why the doctrine of inspiration is necessary because we believe that the Holy Spirit truly guided those people to make the decisions God wished them to make. So, for instance, God, you know, God inspired Mark, the gospel author, to tell God's truth in that book, and then God inspired the church to say, yes, this book is a reflection of God's truth, is God's truth, is God's word, and therefore to include it in the Bible. So, let's talk about some of this variety. We all believe that that uh, that the Bible is God's word, God's inspired word. Some people, some traditions, some churches. Uh, make the step then to say, well, if this is God's inspired word, then it has to be without fault, without error. And the idea, uh, uh, the name for that idea is inerrancy. And it's particularly popular among American fundamentalism, like the Southern Baptist Convention, Missouri Synod believes in inerrancy, uh, other groups, so, and, and plenty of people in the ELCA too. Like I said, it's okay for there to be variety in this. Um, but inerrancy is a belief that uh, at no point is is the Bible not completely true. Well, um, some people will point out, for instance, the flood story. The person that wrote the flood story believed that the world was flat. So the world is pictured as a flat plane, there's a firmament, and then there's an ocean above the firmament, which is why the sky is blue. There's an ocean up there. And what happens in the flood is the pillars of heaven break down, the firmament breaks, and the waters come down, and that's where the flood waters come from. Now, a person coming to that from a scientific mindset might say, well, if that person who wrote that book didn't even know that the world was round, then I'm not going to trust the rest of what he has to say either. If he was wrong about it, the earth being round or flat, then he doesn't know anything. I'm not going to be a Christian. I'm not going to believe the Bible is inspired. On the opposite side of that coin is someone who says, if the Bible says the world's flat, then that world is flat and the scientists are lying to me and the pictures were made up and I'm going to become a flat earther, and I'm going to believe God's word above anything. Now, you can kind of see the truth in both of those things, can't you? If you say, uh, I'm not going to trust him because he's wrong about the way the world is set up, the rest of what he, I'm going to dismiss the rest of what he says. You can also say, this is God's word. I believe that it is inspired. I believe that it is inerrant, and I don't trust the man over here telling me what science and these pictures are saying. So both of those are understandable trains of thought. I come to it and say, you know, is there a middle way? And I, I think that there is. It's the way that I read the scriptures when it comes to this idea of inerrancy. Um, that, um, that, that that book is God's inspired word, uh, but that what it's telling me doesn't have to do with the detail that the earth is flat. The book of Genesis, the book of Exodus, you know, these, they're not about the fact that the earth is flat, that there's a firmament. That's part of the story that came along with it. 
But that story is about uh, God preserving God's faithful people through trial so that they can be righteous and they live righteous lives. Now that's something that can speak to what I'm doing in the current day of living my life of faith. The earth being flat around is a detail that doesn't affect the core message of that story. So I, as a Bible believer, can come to that story and still say, you know, I can say that now to the science person, I, that makes me a religious nutcase, and to the, uh, the flat earther, it makes me a heretic. So the middle way often is very difficult to follow, but I, I, I happen to believe it's the truth in this case, um, that it's true that there is a, a scientific misinformation in that story, and it's also true that it's God's inspired word to guide me on my walk of faith, because that story is not about the earth being flat. It's about uh, God preserving through trial God's faithful people so that they can produce God's righteousness on the earth. And that is is true. That is, that is inspired truth, right? But there's a detail in it that's not, uh, not, not true in a scientific sense. And that's okay with me. <clears throat> so inerrancy is one of those concepts you deal with. Um, Another idea that's very similar but kind of different is the idea of literalism. There's some people that take the step to say, you know, if this is God's inspired word, not only is it without error, but it's also meant to be read completely, literally in every way. There's no metaphor, there's no symbolism, it is all literal. So, in this case, you would have people who believe in a six-day creation. Now, this is a similar argument to the flat earth thing, but, but, but different because... Um, <clears throat> You know, you have uh, scientific evidence that tells us that the Earth is billions of years old and, and uh, the universe came into being through a Big Bang and that we evolved through uh, processes from, from uh, lesser beings, so to speak. Um, and then you've got the Bible with this whole different narrative of a six-day creation, God forming, God, uh, God forming Adam from the dust of the Earth, making Eve from his rib, placing them in the garden with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you are a biblical literalist, then you say, this is God's inspired word. I have to take this at face value and say, this is what happened, and this scientific evidence uh, is wrong. Now, once again, it's a similar situation. From a scientific point of view, you would say, well, <laughs> if the book of Genesis gets wrong, something as basic as how long it took for the earth to come into existence and where humans come from, then I'm going to dismiss anything else it has to say too. It's not true. It's not. It's not true. It's not God's word. It's not inspired. Once again, other side of the coin. Uh, this is God's word. Then science is wrong. Uh, there is no evolution. There is, uh, you know, no Big Bang. It happened exactly like the Book of Genesis said. Once again, I ask the question: Is there a middle way? And I believe there is. Uh, that the Book of Genesis is not about a scientific textbook explanation of how everything came into being. That is certainly part of the story, but the book of Genesis from my reading is about the fact that we are here on purpose. That out of God's loving initiative, God brought us into being. Uh, it's about sin. It's about humankind turning away from that loving creator and that loving creator's intention for his creation, and setting in motion all those events that will lead to Christ and our redemption and our sanctification and our once again, you know, sort of metaphorically taking up residence in Eden by living in accordance with uh, the will of our Creator. So I certainly read Genesis in a metaphorical uh, way. There are plenty of wonderful, faithful Christians who read Genesis much more literally, and I am not by in making this video trying to take up arms against that at that point. But what, what I well, the reason I do uh, talk about this is I think that it'll help a lot of people who struggle with they say, well, I have to pick one. Either I have to say that science is right or faith is right. You know, I have to pick one when it comes to believing that the Bible is inspired. I have to either be a flat earth six day creationer or I have to be uh, a, a non Christian. And the fact is that that's not true. You, you can. Uh, say to yourself, the Bible is God's inspired word, uh, and it depends on how you read the story, how you say to yourself, what is the message of the story? What is God s trying to say at the core by telling me this story? 
And usually the answer doesn't have anything to do with the details that tend to conflict with science. It has to do with something much deeper, much more meaningful uh, than those uh, sort of details that come along with it. Inspiration. So uh, that's a little take on how I come to that understanding. You may uh, come to different conclusions, but I hope this has given you some language to help you think through that. And uh, once again, thank you for your attention, and we'll see you on Sunday in worship, first Sunday of Advent. Exciting time. See you then.